Today, NAR, the National Association of Realtors, entered into a settlement agreement to resolve the home seller class action lawsuits. As part of this, they have agreed to pay out $418 million. The agreement would release NAR and over 1 million NAR members, state and territorial and local realtor associations, and all association-owned MLSs and brokerages with an NAR member as a principal that had a residential transaction volume in 2022 of two billion or below from liability of these claims. Now, I asked Steve Murray. He is a partner with RTC Consulting and the founder of Real Trends. He has also been a an expert witness in several different antitrust lawsuits in the industry. And I asked him to come on the podcast today to give us a little bit of an idea of how this settlement could impact the industry and what real estate brokers specifically should be thinking about right now. And Steve had some really interesting things to say. And there were some other items in the settlement agreement that we thought were interesting, including that an offer of compensation could be made with off-market MLS listings. So there's a lot to hash in, you know, hash out and a lot to figure out. We're, we're not attorneys, and we would definitely say work with your attorney on, on figuring out some of these settlement agreement, some of the settlement agreement rules before making any type of changes. But I want to welcome Steve to the podcast and hear his insight. We had some breaking news today from NAR that they have settled in the Sitzer Burnett case. Um, And I have Steve Murray on with me to talk about some of the ramifications of the settlement and some some of the actual settlement terms and how they may impact real estate, um, the real estate industry in general and real estate brokers as well. So welcome, Steve. Hey, Tracy. Good to be with you. Yeah, so let's just get right into it. Um, so basically, they uh, NAR has settled, and um, it is not final. It has to be approved by the courts. So this is a proposed settlement, um, and they have a they've done a number of things. Why don't we talk about them? Um, let's talk about the compensation offers being moved off the MLS. Right. That's. That is one of the uh, major requirements, that you can no longer have a field on a, an MLS uh, that offers, speaks to or offers compensation. Um, you, cannot, uh, you cannot offer a blanket, offer a compensation through the MLS. Uh, so those things are barred by the settlement. And so in your opinion, what does that mean? Um, you know, to me, commissions are, are generally negotiated, um, you know, individually yes. with, the, with the listing agent. Um, they're now a part of this agreement is that they are requiring buyer representation agreements for all members of Correct. NAR. Yes. Um, you know, how, how do you think that will impact the industry moving forward as far as you know, we've already had commission compression. Do you think it will get worse? Or, you know, tell me what you think the impacts of this will be. Well, first, uh, it's going to be, it's going to take some time to sort this out and see what actually happens. Uh, they've indicated they want these new uh, policies in place by July 1. But it's interesting. I've read the settlement agreement, just finished reading it a short time ago. And obviously not with a lawyer's eye, but tr- layman's eyes. It's a kind of interest to me. They say it'll all go into effect July 1, uh, but they're not sure they'll have final court approval by that time. But it doesn't really matter, right? At some point, either final approval and or, or July 1, probably whichever is sooner, MLSs will no longer have those fields. Okay? that That's clear. Um, what What's going to be the impact? I don't know precisely, but I suspect that when word of this gets out, you're going to have some listing agents telling their sellers that we can no longer offer uh, through the MLS compensation to a buyer's agent. Now, they leave open that, of course, a buyer agent can 
request to be compensated. Uh, they can request to have uh, funds set aside, as they always have, for closing costs or repairs. That's all fine, as long as it's all published ahead of time and transparent. Um, but they also make an exclusion that if you it's an off-market listing, that an off-market listing you can still offer buyer agent compensation. So um, I, I do believe you'll have listing agents and sellers who, if they don't have to pay it and they can't offer it, that there'll be some commission compression because their sellers may take the position that, well, if you don't have to pay the other side, then I'm not going to pay you X. I'll pay you less than X because we don't have to pay the other side. If we end up having to pay the other side, we'll worry about it then. So I do think there'll be some commission compression. Yeah, and and I mean, I think the assumption is that there's listing agents out there who only list and buyer's agent out there who only work with buyers. Right. Um, when in fact, most agents work with both buyers and sellers. Um, and I think there is some confusion with that. What does that mean? Um to a, to a consumer? Does it mean anything to a consumer? You know, here's what I think. Um, uh, I mean, congratulations to plaintiff's counsel and the U.S. Department of Justice. You got what you want. Uh, plaintiff's counsel, you're going to get a huge payday. The harmed consumers, supposedly harmed consumers from the past, will essentially get nothing or pen tenths of pennies on the dollar. Uh, so this isn't about uh, compensating harmed sellers from the past. This is about let's let's extract a half a billion to a billion dollars out of the industry uh, and change this practice. Okay, so the plaintiff's attorneys win. I think the sellers win because I think there will be lower commission costs resulting from this for sellers. And the buyers are now going to be massively confused about what they're supposed to do when now they're requiring buyer agency agreements. Now the buyers are actually going to have to read and understand those agreements. And in some cases, I suppose, they're not, they may or may not understand that they're promising compensation to a buyer agent of an amount which maybe they understand and maybe they don't. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, the buyers have not had to come out of their own sources of funds, despite what a lot of economists say, uh, to buy a home. Um, but now there's a chance that in many or most cases, they're going to be they're going to be in the position where they're going to have to pay to have the services of a buyer agent. And if they don't, then they are going to go direct to the listing agent. And in some cases, if not most cases, they will have little legal representation in the purchase of a home. Now. It, so, you know, sellers win, plaintiff's counsel wins, DOJ wins, and the buyers lose. Agents, we don't know yet, but likely commission revenues will decline. So I guess we could say another loser are brokerage firms and agents. Well, there's also stock, um, stock for Zillow and uh, Homes.com uh, increased today based on this announcement. However, I'm a yeah, little actually, unsure Tracy, how... Actually, Tracy, Zillow took a huge hit today. Did they? Okay. They Zillow were up for a little a bit. Zillow took a huge hit, okay. and CoStar took a big gain. Okay. Which, okay. by the way, reflects some people that know what they're thinking about, because, of course, CoStar's model is revenue from the listing agents. Right. And Zillow, Zillow's revenue model primarily has been for buyers and buyer leads. Do you think there's a misconception, though? I think that yeah. there's this idea that Homes.com or Zillow or Realtor.com yeah. can take over as the national MLS. 
Um, which of course, first of all, the MLSs are feeding them the data that they are getting. Right. So talk a little bit about that misconception um, and why homes.com, other than the fact that they um, really focus on on listing sure. leads, right. um, listing why they would be- revenue. Right. Right. Why, uh, why else would they be a big winner in this? That would be, that would be the sole reason I can think of. I, I, don't, I don't know, and anybody who says they do, I think they're speculating. We don't know exactly what the impact on MLSs is going to be. I mean, uh, the, the settlement says, and I read it to, I read it five times to make sure that I think I understood it, that off market, off MLS listings can still offer buyer agent commission. Period. There's also some language, and I'm not sure I understand it completely that seems to imply that a brokerage firm with its own listings could do so. Its own listings, its own marketing system can can do that. It's, that's what it seems to say. I could be wrong, but it seems to imply it. Well, so, so I'm a seller and I want exposure to the market. Um, there's other ways than the MLS to get information about my property out, by the way, including featuring it on CoStar or Zillow or Realtor.com because they're not MLSs, so they're not enjoined from publishing this, although there is language about data and listing aggregators and some prohibitions of what they can do. We have to wait to see what that how that settles out. But, you know, the truth is, um, my own experience is the Department of Justice would, in its own mind, love to see the realtor MLSs go away. So, I mean, this exclusion for off-market listings being able to continue to offer cooperative compensation, that, that's kind of like... We'll have to wait and see just how many people go down that path. I I think we're going to have all kinds of new, all kinds of new structures evolve from this, in terms of brokerage marketing systems, their own listing marketing systems. I can see all potentially new companies arising to offer uh, limited service buyer services. I mean, we just don't know how much and how widespread that will be, but it will be far less homogenous a marketplace than it has been. And it, it, it really, it's going to, it's going to, um, it, it's going to put a lot of pressure on the incumbents as to how a, they're going to adapt their brokerage companies and agents adapt their practice um, in this new environment and how they're going to communicate that if it's a brokerage company, how they're going to educate their agents and staff and for agents, how they're going to educate sellers and buyers. It's, it's a massive undertaking. It'll take some time to sort out. Well, let's go into some of these new business models. What, what would they look like? What do you, what do you see them looking like? And, and it seems to me that big brokers have a huge advantage in this, um, because if they want to, you know, they have obviously control over their all of their listings. Look, if if I'm a, and again, I haven't spoken to any of my uh, my contacts among the large brokerage firms, um, but it would occur to me that some have already, I'm sure, have already started thinking about, okay, if this was to happen, how am I going to? keep some revenues on from buy side representation and service and how am I going to keep the market as fluid as we can right and so I could see the evolution for instance of something that looks like a transaction management service for buyers to handle all the details that a buyer's agent normally does or has done 
uh, and maybe offers it at, at some flat fee. I could envision even companies like title insurance companies who do a lot of this anyway, perhaps offering those kind of services. It's unclear, you know, that, the, I mean, first of all, the title companies, you know, they certainly have the infrastructure to do it. Uh, but will they want to step on their real estate clients who are the source of a lot of their business? That's what we call channel conflict. Um, how, for how many brokers will move to put in a transaction type service for buyers at, a, at, at um, a fee that a buyer can afford and will think is valuable when they got agents sitting there wanting to continue to get paid as full buyer agents. I mean, there's another channel. Con so there's a lot of these channel conflicts that likely prevent incumbents of all kinds from acting quickly. Kind of interesting. Um, anyway, there's a number of challenges to sort this all out. It's interesting to me in the settlement that this has got to be in place either upon final settlement approval or July 1. I mean, to get all this done and to sort all this out in four months or less than four months now, <laughs> it, it'll be interesting to see how this industry can adapt in that short a period of time with this kind of a change. Well, there was also an article in the New York Times that um, was quoted that the billions in savings um, that home buyers will now have, um, you know, will release more inventory and and lower home prices. You know, tell me tell me about how that is working and where is all that money coming from? Do you want to quote me on this, Tracy? <laughs> yes. Economists and other idiots have been saying that for years, that if commissions were lower, home prices would drop. My answer to them is, what planet do you live on? And B, have you ever sold a home or bought a home? I, I think, no. I mean, I said right at the outset, the, the one of the losers in this are buyers because now they're not going to have an agent working on their behalf by settled law and regulation, an agent who represents their interests, where they have not directly had to write a check for it, didn't pay more for the house than they would have otherwise, and got that kind of service, and now they're being denied that in great part by this settlement. They don't the buyer doesn't win in any way you look at this. The buyer doesn't win. That's my opinion. Yeah, there were, they also um, compared it to a possible new deal. Um, you know, it, this is going to be the new deal in, um, in regulation. Um, I don't I don't see the corollary there but i but I, I mean it'll obviously change the way business is being done um what are your thoughts on that well only the new york times would call it a new deal um i don't i don't see any connection whatsoever there but i guess it's their opinion as i said earlier sellers stand to benefit i would think plaintiffs attorneys benefit Brokerage companies and agents will suffer under this, and buyers will suffer the most. Brokers uh, and agents are going to adapt. Brokers and agents will adapt. They will adapt. I'm highly confident the men and women who run national, regional, local brokers and the best agents in the industry, they will adapt. They will figure it out. It could be their incomes will, uh, on a current level of production will go down. Their answer always historically has been, I'll adapt and I'll figure out a way to keep making my business work. And I'm confident they will do so. So let's talk about the release of liability because um, they basically said that it is for um, a transaction volume, residential transaction volume in 2022 of $2 billion or below. 
Um, that leaves out, I believe you said about 130 some companies, although that's not completely accurate because some of them are under the um, umbrella of different franchises. So tell me a little bit about who isn't covered and that, um, as I understand it, there's a pathway for them as well. And, and I, this wasn't clear in the settlement that I read. I, I tried to look for it, but I think what it means is any privately owned brokerage who is not a member of an anywhere Keller Williams or Remax franchise is uncovered, who did more than $2 billion in sales in 2022. It means that the plaintiff's attorneys did not want to release them under this because there's still settlement money to be gained from them. That's how I've read it. I think that's my understanding of it. It means if I'm a privately owned brokerage, I'm not with an Anywhere, Remax, or Keller Williams franchise, that I am unprotected. And here's a path for you to figure out how to get included, which means how much money, I'm, how big a check do I have to write to the plaintiff's attorneys? Yeah, it was based on some formula, from what I understand. Um, you know, and so in your in your estimation, about how many brokerages are there that are not covered and will have to to do this? Eighty, eighty to a hundred in that ballpark. Could be a few a few more. I mean, a few less. Okay. Could be sixty. Okay. I haven't really looked at the ranking list of real trends to see which how many there are but you know 50 to 80 firms safely are probably uncovered unprotected what are some other interesting um things to, that you saw with the settlement um agreement that you found interesting or impactful to the industry and i'm not an attorney but i i did see in one of the pair in one of the sections that uh, assuming this settlement agreement was approved if in the future the U.S. Department of Justice, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, or any state attorneys general bring action against any of these defendants um, that exceed this agreement, that this is clearly not, does not limit future actions by any of those parties to take legal action against the industry. I found that interesting leaves a door open for the Federal Trade Commission, the U.S. Department of Justice, or the various state attorney generals, if they want to go further than this agreement, then this agreement does not cover those. And obviously the DOJ is um, has stepped into other settlement agreements, um, specifically with MLS Penn. But what, um, I mean, what does this mean then for you, you had said to me one time, I, I believe it was you who said that the DOJ generally goes after specific companies and not an industry as a whole. So this is somewhat, I think, unprecedented. Can you talk a little bit to that? Well, Tracy, I've done some homework. There are numerous cases where they went after a whole industry who they thought they were colluding. It's not the norm. Uh, usually that's the Federal Trade Commission, which is more on protecting consumers. Okay. Um, final takeaways. What um, what should brokers be doing right now based on this proposed settlement? I'm highly confident brokers and agents will figure out how to adapt first. Second, so you have to, as a brokerage firm, and if I'm an agent or a team, I have to, first of all, I'm going to have to make very, very sure that we have solid buyer agency agreements in place because that's required by part of the settlement. Second thing is, depending on the makeup of my business, um, I have to figure out if, in fact, sellers now say, uh, I don't have to pay the buy side commission. Um, and we see that commission compression. How am I going to first fix my business model and my cost based on that? And second, how am I going to serve buyers best 
this, in this environment. And third, I have to, I have to have my own counsel look at this and talk to my state regulators about this, this apparent, um, uh, allowance for off-market listings can still offer uh, co compensation to a buyer's agent. What does that mean? D does that mean, that, and it seems to say that a broker can do it within their own brokerage system. What does that mean? We don't, I don't know what that, I don't exactly know what that means. I, I, I know how it reads, but I know better to know that that completely describes it. What are the opportunities there for me as a company? What are the opportunities? Yeah. Um, if I am in cross-marketing of mortgages, title, and insurance, escrow, whatever it is, you need to take stock of the fact that a lot of that business was driven, driven from your buyer-controlled sales. What, what happens to that business if the number of buyer-controlled sales that I have declines? If 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 you're a large brokerage, those are the things you need to be thinking about right now. Yeah. Yep. Because uh, it looks like this is going to get finalized, and and then lastly, if I'm one of those whatever fifty to eighty uncovered large brokerage companies, I mean, for me, the fact that NER wrote this settlement and said they couldn't get the plaintiffs count counsel to agree to a settlement unless they could remain targets of the plaintiff's counsel, that would give me pause as to just whether my own association really cares about me at all and bailed themselves and my, my smaller competitors out and left me hanging. Interesting last thought, Steve. <laughs> I hate to say that, but I, I, I mean, if I were one of them, I haven't talked to any of them, but if I'm sure when I do, which I will, they are they're, they're going to question whether they should remain in the realtor organization based on that that's just my take on it well and i guess that leads to another question i said we had final thoughts but what does the future of the nar and the state associations look like to you there'll always be a national state local association of realtors i really believe they serve an important function in all kinds of different areas Apart from, you know, national lobbying, I think many of them do an extremely fine job at stimulations, local regulations, training, various other jobs, various and legal issues. I think they'll always have a role and an important role, but I think there's a chance they're going to see a greatly diminished membership. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining the podcast today. I really appreciate you offering your insights um, based on your years of industry experience.